PPI is deflationary right now. The low this year, year over year, is minus 3.3%. The latest reading is minus 4%. And the peak in 2008, for context, was plus 9.9%. So we're showing more significant deflationary tendencies now. Now, PPI is a high beta to CPI. It's a, it's a leading indicator index. It's basically about a two beta. I think it's just a matter of time. You think things like CPI print negative, maybe not right away, maybe not next year. But remember, the key thing for that measures CPI is, is uh, U.S. home value or the value of a home and owner's equivalent rent. And I would point it out um, lately that the wealth effect we saw in housing is just starting to revert, um, similar to did when it peaked in 79 and when it peaked in 2005. The wealth effect is now showing signs of reversing. This is a signal for what's possibly a coming recession, as well as possibly the greatest economic reset of our times. What does this mean for not just investors, but also the everyday consumer? Let's find out with our next guest, Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. First, a word from our sponsor, I Trust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and 1% trading fees, the lowest in the crypto IRA space. If you're over 18, you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, click on itrust.capital slash David to learn more in the link down below and get started. Mike, welcome back to the show. It's always good to see you. Thanks for having me back, David. Good to see you. It was good to see you as always. We spoke several months ago back then in the summertime. You were warning my audience about what's coming and what's coming could be potentially a great economic reset. I think were your words. You were calling for deflation of all things to come. We haven't seen deflation outright and everything yet, although inflation has been coming down. So your trajectory has been correct. Uh, before we get into some of the articles you wrote recently, including why uh, there's a reverse wealth effect, we'll get into that. Walk us through your thesis one more time. Why will we see deflation? Is it a money supply problem? Is it an economic slowdown problem? Is it a supply abundance problem? What is it? All of the above. You got it. The number one way to get deflation is from the high base. And the base we got at the, to the peak of money supply, peak of risk assets in 2022 and 2021 was the highest ever. Now, there's many measures to look at that. And we're just simply reverting that. So as far as you did mention money supply, M2 money supply in this in, in latest measures in this country are running almost minus 4%. That's negative. It's never happened. M3 money supply in Europe is running about minus 1.6%, I think. Uh, PPI, the latest measure, is minus 0.4. That looks pretty deflationary to me. And then you look over at U.S. Fed funds, the rate right now is 5.5%. That's above the peak from right before the uh, right when we started cutting rates in 2007. So to me, if you come from another planet, you look at those, that data and you say, okay, that's deflation. And what our rates do, they're still going up. So I look at it as just getting started. The bottom line is what Milton Friedman says, is, is inflation is monetary phenomenon always. And the key trend right now is towards disinflation. I fully expect it to accelerate towards deflation next year, unless there's some kind of major stimulus, money, print, money printing or something to alleviate that natural tendency and cycle in markets. Uh, just to clarify, when you say deflation, you're referring to the overall headline CPI being below zero, or are you referring yeah. to certain assets or commodities going into deflation? Well, let's start with commodities. Commodities peaked last year. Okay. Crude oil peaked at 130, and as we speak, it's 75 bucks. So it's almost 50% correction. Natural gas, the number one measure of heat, electricity, and fertilizer, peaked around 10. It dropped to two, and right now it's around three. So that's pretty deflation. So commodities are by nature deflationary because humans create more with less every day, and we find stuff. But in the headline measures, we will get there. It's a matter of time now. So I like to point out the PPI is deflationary right now. The low this year, year over year, is minus 3.3%. The latest reading is minus 4%. And the peak in 2008, for context, was plus 9.9%. So we're showing more significant deflationary tendencies now. Now, PPI is a high beta to CPI. It's a, it's a leading indicator index. It's basically about a two beta. I think it's just a matter of time. You think things like CPI print negative, maybe not right away, maybe not next year. But remember, the key thing for that measures CPI is, is uh, U.S. home value or the value of a home and owner's equivalent rent. And I would point it out um, lately that the wealth effect we saw in housing is just starting to revert, um, similar to did when it peaked in 79 and when it peaked in 2005. There are some people who believe that deflation in our economy is a sign of coming prosperity as your living standards may increase or improve when things are cheaper. Is that what you're alluding to? Is that what's coming? But part of that, you, you just quoted 
the premise of the book, Super, Super Abundance. I don't remember the author's name, but it's just how prosperity cranks its own natural deflationary forces. What I'm referring to is the, the historical cycle of David, the biggest pump in liquidity in history, bar none. It's only comparable to really to 1928, 29, and the biggest, quickest dump in history, bar none. I and mean, we took rates from zero to 5.5% in the US and Canada and ECB and Bank of England and most other countries at the fastest pace ever. And now we're just seeing that normal effects of that just starting to kick in. Um, so to me, let's look at deflation as you look at, let's look at the macro standpoint. In Europe, GDP is already running negative. Retail sales are negative. PMIs, services, and actual purchasing matters are below 50, and rates are high, and were rising just a few months ago. Uh, in China, you see pretty significant property crisis. Our Bloomberg Economics team says it's probably only going to get worse. Um, and then you look at the U.S., things like leading indicators. Yes, they've been early. Yes, Bloomberg Economics have been early. But what's happened this year? We had this pretty significant wealth effect, kept things going, significant fiscal stimulus, and the Fed added another 100 basis points to rate. So just see that tilt just starting to tick down. And the last thing they usually go is the stock market. And it's still, let's put it this way, stock market won Thanksgiving, but it's, is it going to win Christmas? Typically, that's kind of a farmer's term. When you win one, you give up the other oftentimes. Okay, well, we, we can't have both. It's too much to ask for <laughs> We both. can, but it's unlikely. Um, I'll, I'll read a paragraph from one of your recent reports. Uh, reverse wealth effect could be top commodity risk. You mentioned the reverse wealth, wealth effect kicking in from the housing perspective already, but um, let's take a listen to this. Spiking commodities, you wrote, spiking commodities can fuel a recession, and prices typically get relatively cheap before bottoming, which may portend the stage of the cycle at year end. What do you mean by that? So um, those are facts that typically when commodities spike at the velocity they did last year, uh, the two year change to the peak in crude oil was the highest ever. It even succeeded um, 1973, 74 oil crisis. Typically it sparks a recession and oftentimes markets have to get cheap to reset things. So what you're and they haven't yet. So I've been calling for WTI crude oil to get to near 40 for too long. I admit that I've been early. I've been wrong. But now we're starting to see that tilt. You usually have to go get cheap to reset. So the last three lows in WTI crude oil, starting with that bottom in 2008 and 9, was 40 and then lower. So lower lows and the highs have been lower. So what stops that? Typically, you need a pretty significant demand pull or supply shock. And now we're all tilting the other way. We're seeing significant decline in demand and diesel demand, unleaded gas, natural gas, and container boards, um, coriander boxes in, all US, in the U.S. all going down, yet supply is reaching all-time new highs. If you Certainly, if you include U.S. and Canada, now OPEC's trying to offset that. So that's the energy standpoint. But the key thing, bottom line, is commodities are doing what they normally do in a cycle after they spike like that. The key thing I wanted to point out last year, I think, is true, is that those forces of elasticity, supply and demand, are stronger than ever. Don't underestimate technology. I mean, I come from a farm background, and you can bring on corn and beans in a year, and we've done that. We've made record, record supply in North America and South America. Now that's pushing things over. But the bottom line is the wealth effect. So one thing I like to point out is if you take that S&P 500 divided by GDP, take that, and GDP simplistically is $27 trillion if you just add two zeros. That number, that metric has been a very good indication for the S&P 500 since 1928. The S&P 500 recently to stand at 22 is the most stretched versus GDP as it was in the 1930s. So that was a significant wealth effect. And why do we do that? Because we pumped up money supply 41% from the end of 2019. Now that's starting to tick down, but that massive wealth effect made everybody feel rich. And then we had that massive fiscal stimulus. It pushed off this recession. So now I think it's all starting to tilt that downward and we almost always get reversion in the stock market versus GDP back to more normal level. The commodity is already starting to do that. I, one thing way I like to look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index and the S&P 500 is you just take it at a five-year relative to a five-year average, typically it gets down to about a 20% discount to its 60-month moving or 60-month or five-year average. And right now we're still about a 10% surplus. So the trajectory is downward in commodities. That makes sense with the exception of gold, back on the back of the tilt towards recession and, and the high prices last year. The key thing is what happens with that wealth effect from the stock market. It has to stay high just to keep commodities stable. And you already see the tilt. They're just declining despite that. But if you get a normal recession, there's a lot of room for the stock market to simply revert towards its historical pattern, historical relationship with nominal GDP.
That was my next point. Uh, excellent segue. Uh, you mentioned to me last time that should we enter a recession, which I believe or I gather from what you said, is still your view. Um, should we enter a recession? Recessions typically historically have seen uh, equity markets fall 50% from peak to trough. Uh, the peak in this particular cycle being late last year at November last year. Um, the, the recent climb in equity prices in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ uh, from four weeks ago, has that changed your view at all? Has that changed your thesis about this 50% decline? Unfortunately not. It's just, I think, part of the latter stages of a typical cycle. Well, people have not figured out yet that the Federal Reserve will not be there to save them and save you when stock market goes down like it has for them entire history. You go back since 1950s, every single time the S&P 500 was down 20% or so on a 12-month basis, the Fed always was cutting rates. One exception was 1988 because it was in the back aftermath of the 1987 crash. Don't expect that. The Fed has said it's not going to happen. Markets have already priced for that ease. The market's looking for that hopium of ease from the Fed, and I don't think they're going to get it. Maybe you will, but the key thing is what's going to be the trigger. Now, inflation me metrics that they watch, David, personal consumption expenditures, employment cost indices should stay sticky. Bloomberg Economics expect those to stay around 3% next year. The target's 2 and right now they're 4 But my measures that I watch, commodities, Gold, beating every commodity on, on the board, every major commodity, declining crude oil, declining industrial metals. That whole bent tells me where the, the trend is going. So I look at it as I'm fearful that the stock market is going to do what it normally does a recession, and it's going to find out the hard way that what's pumped it up for decades, and certainly from the bottom in 2009, is gone. And that is the Federal Reserve easing with the ease it has in the past. So the market's priced for that ease. So that's why I'm concerned. Now, the stock market could make new, new highs, but I also like to point out, if you look at things like 100-week moving averages, 20-month moving averages for the S&P 500 and the Russell, they're starting to roll over, but you look at rates are still high. So what I see is, let's see how things pan out for Christmas. And the bottom line is there is a significant alternative. The two-year note is still around 5%. And I think that's what most prudent investors are doing. They're saying, thank you. I can lock in a 10% return in two years from a U.S. government two-year note or about that. So why should it take the risk and risk assets? So here's the key thing also to look forward to next year. One main reason the stock market really bounced this year is because it was really beat up last year. And the consensus at the end, beginning of the year was recession. Remember? So that didn't work out. But now the Nasdaq's up over 45% this year. And the consensus is soft landing, no problem. So just like at a normal risk tilt, it's very bad for risk assets. Maybe it'll work out. That wouldn't be great. Let's just say if we have a normal pullback of, say, 20% after rallying 40%. There's your tilt of the dominoes falling towards significant deflation. That, to me, is the risk. Commodities are already pointing that way. Yields, the inverted curve are already pointing that way. Consumer spending is pointing that way. And most of the metric, metrics and commodities, I, like I like to, like to mention, one thing I watched closely when I traded treasuries in the pits in the, in the 80s was we watched the corrugated boxes, con, boxes, container boards. The demand for the container boards in this country is about the same as it was during the depth of the eight, 2008 crisis. And I, I, one other thing I want to mention, durable goods for October came out today. They are around, down around 5.6% or so. The last time we were down more than that was Oct in October was 2008. Okay, so I'm looking at the um, S&P 500, the stock uh, charts. Uh, like I mentioned, it peaked in uh, late 2021, November. Uh, terrible year in 2022, like you brought up. Here's my theory, and please challenge this if you disagree. Uh, given that... The textbook, finance textbook teaches uh, teaches that uh, stock markets or equity markets are forward looking. Perhaps the equity investors already priced in a recession last year, which happened this year. It just wasn't officiated by the NBER or whatever other organization yet. Now, it's hard to claim we have a recession this year okay. with unemployment. Now, unemployment did bottom at 3.4%. So let's remember how recessions really get – there's so many ways they metric them. But typically, unemployment going up is a key thing. One thing I want to bring in employment is there is we have never had a bottom from unemployment from around below 4% that it hasn't peaked around 6% ever. Now, the lowest – we reached the lowest level since the 50s lately, early 60s. Typically, and in Bloomberg Economics, expects it to peak around 5% next year. See that trajectory? There's really no room for it to go but up. And then you look at CPI and things like PPI, they're just starting to turn downward. 
turning down in inflation, heading lower, unemployment heading higher, and rates are still high. So I think what the market did is it's just kind of getting beat up before one of the biggest resets of our lifetime. But there's a good foundation for that. We had a 100-year event. We had the most explosive pump in liquidity ever. Remember, we thought we were going to all die about three years ago. And now it's simple reversion. I like to point out reversion can be extreme. Now, the stock market, it's still going strong. And it's great, but I'm still fearful that there is that giant black hole of of 5% on average in U.S. treasuries that people can invest in. That's that's changed for most people. Those highest rates in almost two decades, I think, has changed the metrics of what happened to risk assets. They got so extensive, expensive. Housing in the stock market, people forgot in the lowest zero and longest period of zero environment interest rates ever. Well, the facts have changed. And I don't think we started that reversion process yet. Now, we have in commodities and the stock market and housing, things like that, normal. Typical normal cycles are they have to get somewhat cheap, and they're nowhere even near, obviously, very expensive still. And one thing that has is the Russell small caps have um, showing that bent this year. You, you mentioned unemployment. So I think you were indirectly alluding to uh, the SOM rule, which is that if yeah. the unemployment rate ticks up by an average, a three-month average of 0.5% from the bottom, we're officially in a recession. That's happened every single time in history. I yeah. actually interviewed Claudia Soff about this topic. She said that she believes this time – her rule will be triggered, but it will be broken for the first time since yeah. history. Um, but, how would you respond to that? Yeah. I love that. I've heard people say that about leading indicators and about the yield curve. And it's don't underestimate human nature following the tape, David. It's, I so enjoy watching that sometimes. And yes, everybody's bull in the stock market because it went up. Um, is it going to go up because it went up like it did in the past? That's the key thing you have to work out. That mantra, I think, is over because the Fed's not there to help you. So I will stick with the facts of history. I'll stick with the cycles. I'll stick with the indicators from things like industrial metals, which are down a lot this year. Energy, which is down a lot this year. Agriculture, which is down a lot. They're tilting towards that deflationary recession. And also there's a part of that fact. It's the dollar, David. Look what's happening with the dollar. Both the the biggest second two second two and three biggest countries in the world, China and Japan and Germany, all there. Certainly not Germany as much are having to support their currencies because their rates are so much less than the U.S. So the dollar is a giant wrecking ball. So that's what's hitting commodities. It's hitting a global economy, and I think is um, I think these measures are going to be more significant and more indicative of the extent of the reset than ever. But the thing is, the only way they ever work is when people think they will stop working. When everybody agrees, we saw that at the beginning of the year. When everybody thinks there's a recession, it ain't going to have it. So that's why the risk and tilt is, okay, you made 45% in the NASDAQ a year. That's awesome. Uh, and you can you know, get that 5% in two notes. Is, I just say expecting that not to revert a little bit, would be, I think, is a bit irrational. Uh, how would you explain retail sales continuing to go up in nominal terms, uh, it seems like people are still spending, or at least have the appetite to spend. Where's that money coming from? So retail sales, um, as a X CPI, are actually negative. The latest region are negative. They're similar to ones in 2008. In in Europe, if you look at same thing, retail sales divided by inflation are actually negative. So part of that is number one, part of the wealth effect. We've had massive fixed fiscal stimulus, and and this is also part of most people have not experienced this kind of inflation. I grew up with it in the 70s, so you kind of get used to it. Um, and I remember most candy bars when they kept shrinking, it was kind of tough when you were 15, <laughs> for 13. But um, right. that, that's the key thing is remember is retail. I love, enjoy publishing this retail sales, XCPI have been negative at most significant pace. If you, you know, the distortion of the pandemic out there is as the 2008 great financial crisis. And the key difference is in September, 2007, the Fed started ease. They were just hiking in July. So that's the big difference. You need that long and variable lag to Federal Reserve ease before you should expect the bottom in commodities and the bottom in the stock market. The thing is, commodities already started rolling over. Stock market has and it's bounced. That's where I think the risk reward is. Um, this might have been one of the biggest short covering rallies in, in history in the stock market. I, I have two questions on the wealth effect. I'd like to understand a bit more. So the first is uh, how significant is the spending of the top 10% or the top 5%? Uh, in the wealth bracket in the United States, I ask this because uh, presumably the bottom fifty percent who don't own any wealth, the wealth the wealth effect doesn't apply to them, right? They're not. Yeah. So that's a key point. I'm glad you asked that. So it's it's the sixty two percent or so of U.S. households that own their homes that 
everybody who owned a home felt that significant wealth wealth effect. Basically, the average increase in wealth was 40%. And if you didn't own much stocks, but the major asset in most North American countries in U.S. and Canada is a home, over 60%. So if your home, the average price of a home dumped from three to 500,000 approximately, I mean, that's a big number. If your normal day monthly expenses go up total on an annual basis of 10,000, it doesn't matter. That's what the trickle down in the fact is. So I like to take the FHA U.S. housing price index. I divide by per capita GDP, and it recently just popped to around 11. The low before this started in uh, like 2015 or so, the low was um, about eight, eight to one. So it's super high, and we've had similar highs since 79, since 2005, that really were similar to the Bloomberg um, commodities peaking uh, around the same time. The commodities already started heading lower. And to me, it's just a matter of time we see that normal reversion in that wealth effect. That wealth effect. And what's the difference there? What created that wealth effect? The big pump in money supply and peaked at 41% from the end of 2019 in Q1, 22. And now it's down, it's running around 34%. So it's dropping, it's dropped around 5%. So money supply is negative. And if you follow the money, the indications are you should not be getting uh, should be very careful with risk assets have you done any studies where looked into the lag between our change in wealth and actual spending so suppose my house increases in value this year uh after what point do i start spending more and the reverse if my house decreases in value next year at what point do i start spending less yeah, so that's a good point. It's one of the things I haven't done the specific um, quantitative analysis, but as you pointed out, my recent headline was the housing domino could tumble with commodities. I point out a chart going back to 1975. And I show every time we spiked with the velocity we did recently in housing, recessions follow soon afterwards because you get that wealth effect that pumps things up. The Fed tightens, and then you move down, and everything just rolls over. This, the recent one, was just unprecedented. So the tilt already started in commodities. The tilt started in industrial metals and energy. Key, and it hasn't started in the stock market. And the key question, David, is usually at this stage, the Fed would have been easing, but they're not. Why? Because inflation is still ticky, sticky, their metrics. So to me, there's the, the, the lose-lose scenario. And I'm very worried that if you just get a little bit of mean reversion in this massive wealth effect, which always has happened, there's your dominoes for significant deflation. So when we're doing this in November, right around Thanksgiving next year, I think deflation will be the tip of our tongues. And I would be delighted if that's not the case. But if you just point out the facts of history and where things are heading, um, that is the canon. Here's what I fully expect. There's going to be many entities pressuring or clamoring for the Fed to ease and add liquidity, and they just won't do it the way they have in the past. I mean, Paul Volcker got death threats um, because he was tightening too much. So I fully expect that's just a normal cycle. The question is what stops it. And everything, all my data says that concept of a soft landing, which is a consensus, is going to be very unlikely. Like I just said, the key latest piece of data just came out today was durable goods down the most for the month of October since 2008. Industrial production also down the last reading, um, many other indicators. Uh, so you're, you're expecting recession by roughly Q2 next year, Q1? Well, so that's the key thing that's been rough. Missed it, been late. Our economists thought by the end of this year, Bloomberg Economics team, they've been early, can say they're wrong. But the key point I like to point out is at the beginning of the year, at the end of last year, when their model said in 12 months, now they were already at the 12 months, what's changed? Well, we've had that massive wealth effect that stayed there, and we've had the most significant fiscal stimulus without a war, without a recession ever. I mean, our fiscal deficit jumped up around 8% this year. Now it's running around 6%. That's never happened to that extreme without um, a recession or a war. But what's that also done? We've The Fed added another 100 basis points. <laughs> So you see the tilt? They're just going to keep rising, hiking in rates until I think something goes, until the stock market goes down and tells them to stop. So I think that's what the market's missing is we're priced for almost 90 basis of basis points of cuts by about this time next year. And I don't see that happening unless the stock market makes them. I'd like to ask you about uh, yields on a longer term basis. So if you take a look at the 10 year yield, you zoom out all the way back to 1965, which I have in front of my screen. Um, You'll see that the 10-year yield peaked in the last 60 years or so in 1981 at 15.8%, give or take. Um, ever since the early uh, early 80s, the 10-year yield has been on a steady downward trend, troughing at around 0.5%, uh, uh, 0.6% at the end of 2020. 
ever since 2020, as you know, it's been on an upwards trajectory. Uh, the question some people have is whether or not this upwards trajectory is the beginning of a long-term bear market for bonds, meaning interest rates will continue to go up in a multi-decade phase like we saw in prior times in history. What do you think? Uh, completely. I'll take the other side of that trade, that position, and I will refer to a great Canadian named Jeff Booth who wrote the book, The Price of Tomorrow. Yes. Um, and that to me is just part of what we should expect here. Is it? Let's remember, we had a multi-decade bull market in bonds, declining bond yields. Did the fundamentals of that reverse because of COVID? And I like to say no. What it did is provided a blip that's going to accelerate the downward trend. Now, we're seeing that in commodities. What we saw with, with um, COVID is that massive pump in money supply created inflation, and then the war with Russia invading Ukraine pumped up the inflation. What's happened since? Commodities adjust, people adjust, they create more with less, and everything's starting to tilt lower. It's just getting started. So to me, that's going to be one of the best, biggest trades next year is that massive Massive pump in yields is going to reverse. We'll go back to the long-term trend downward in yields and upward in bond prices. U.S. Treasury long bonds, I think, will be one of the best performers next year. And that's just simple reversion. I mean, TLT was one of them got hard, hit hard this year. Just pop up 20 to 30 percent is normal. So that's the thing that people are missing. Did the fundamentals of that 30 or so bull market bonds reverse? And that's when I go back to books like Sidney Homer's uh, History Interest Rates. I mean, I read that. I used to read it a lot when I was trading treasuries decades ago but to me this is just a blip and we'll see by next year um within a few months if i'm not right about this and this is the key thing the bottom line i think david is that wealth effect the the key thing i'm worried about is just a little bit normal reversion of the stock market and housing going back to their historical valuations versus nominal gdp just a little reversion in that which is normal is severely deflationary because people forgot how high the base is now we have such a high base. I think the FHA housing index doubled in about the last 10 years and just popped up 40% in the last three years. That base is so high, unless we have some massive fuel to keep it higher, just normal reversion means you get deflation. Um, that is just how typical how it works. And that's like to say commodities are deflating. Crude oil average price this year is about $78 a barrel. That was first traded in 2007. The price of natural gas this year dropped to First prices first started trading in 1990. Now, the other measure, the thing is, commodities are good beta, I think, leading indicator for inflation and deflation. The bottom line is, we have to sustain this wealth effect where it is now. And remember what got us there. Biggest pump in liquidity ever. Right now, what is liquidity doing? Money supply is negative in the U.S. and Europe. Yeah. Well, we covered uh, a lot of ground today. Pretty much every single asset class uh, on my list, equities, real estate, uh, commodities, and uh fixed income a little bit. Uh, I'd like to close on the U.S. dollar. So uh, your view on the DXY, given, given, well, given what you just said about yields, actually. So let, let's, let's, you know, that's a good segue. So the key thing about the dollar I like to point out is the U.S. trade weighted, the broad dollar. You have to include China in there, partly because of the, the great trading partners. The key number thing to remember about the dollar is it's the most expensive, one of the most expensive to short um, currencies on the planet and versus every other currency. <laughs> so what do you, what do you mean expensive to short? It's, it's the rates are just too high. I mean, 5% okay. is your base rate in the U S what's I your see, base yeah. rate in China, 2%. Right, what's okay. your base rate in, in Japan, less than 2%. Those are top companies. What's your base rate in Europe, maybe three to 4%. It's just too expensive to short. And then it has the, obviously this war going on. And the key thing I think people forgot about the dollar is watching the newest technology in the planet, which way it went cryptos cryptocurrencies crypto dollars i like to call them crypto dollars that asset class went for the dollar's base layers the thing i learned in hong kong in 2018 when the whole world have never can get access to the buck through their phones through a crypto dollar or a stable coin that shows the world's organic tilt towards the buck versus every other currency so yeah there'll be bumps in the road but here's the here's the lose-lose about the dollar you basically need the u.s stock market and u.s um and u.s economic data to go down because those have been what's been driving the dollar what's been driving the dollar really up since the bottom around 2011 is the u.s stock market outperforming the world and there's the lose-lose so for the dollar weakness you need the stock market goes down everything goes down with it maybe dollar Stabilized a little bit. But in the meantime, if you're holding dollars and you're trying to short it against uh, any other, most other currencies, it's costing you a lot of money on a daily basis because you, it's, um, it's the highest, one of the highest yield and the deepest treasury in the planet, treasury market.
got to ask you about Bitcoin. Let's close off on Bitcoin uh, since you brought it up. Uh, yeah. The recent rally in Bitcoin. Uh, do you think that the uh, BTC price has fully priced in the uh, spot ETF anticipation, meaning that $37,000 is the highest we're going to get once it's actually been approved, given that it's more or less anticipated at this point? That word anticipation, I think the answer is yes. The market's priced in a significant amount of FOMO and buying because of ETFs. And I think what it's missing is Bitcoin is still, relative to the number one benchmark uh, risk asset in the world, it's still about a three, three, vol three times volatility asset. It's still much more higher volatility than, than the U.S. Uh, stock market, S&P 500, than gold and U.S. Treasury. So I'm fearful if I'm right about this normal reset and stock market goes down, that it pulls all risk assets down, particularly in Bitcoin. So I'm concerned that the market is trading up on one of the simplest, easiest trades ever. Oh, it's going to go up because there's an ETF. That's one thing I'm worried about, David. And one of the things about Bitcoin is when I got really bullish on it in April 2019, when it was around three to 4,000, up to 5,000 because everybody still, there's a lot of haters out there. Now there's just so much consensus it's going to go up. You got to be careful buying an asset that is widely well, expected you, you to rise. <laughs> you don't buy the argument that uh, should equities fall, uh, it, it's Bitcoin will be a safe haven uh, anti-volatility yeah. play? At some point, yes. But right now it still has a high beta equities. It needs to prove it. So let's look at what happened in 2023. Everything's up. Bitcoin's went up more, right? Most risk assets. What happened in 22? Everything went down. Bitcoin went down, down more. That's a high beta asset. It hasn't changed. So I like to say it's been a great leading indicator. The latest breakout was a good leading uh, indicator for the stock market to follow. But we have to look forward to number one thing in risk management. When you sit in front of that value at risk model and you see a high beta asset that has three times the volatility, the benchmark and for global assets on the planet, S&P 500, I'm like, yeah, good luck. It's supposed to do that eventually. That's what people tell me who want me to buy it, who have a vested interest. But the rules of markets are typically positive, positive beta assets with high volatility usually go down when the tide goes out. And at some point, I think I just need to see the proof that it's showing the divergent strength that right now it's just up with everything else. The his key thing I like to point out is one of the best performing assets this year is GBTC, the great scale Bitcoin trust. Now that looks like it still has more upside because of it going to ETFs. And that has been the better play, I think, in, uh, in Bitcoin because of that tilt towards ETFs. I don't think I've ever asked you about the Bitcoin happening. Let's end it here. Bitcoin happening is happening next year. Uh, people have pointed out that every single time it's halved six months after it's happening, uh, the price has gone up. Can you give us a case as to how or why this time could be different if you were to present a this time is different case? It's a known known. Everybody knows it. I'm not ever really been much to analyze the known knowns like that. Everybody points it out. It's, but it's also a key thing that's always kept me somewhat overall bullish of Bitcoin. That's diminishing defined supply. I mean, it's so great to measure it. It's going to go from, what, 900 coins a day to 450 coins a day. Boom, that's it, bar none. And demand and adoption going up. Over time, that asset should go up. But it's such a known known. I'm more worried about the macro that's already been a, a priced in that we're going to just continue all assets rising, Bitcoin rides, rise, rise is more. What I'm worried about is just the normal recession, stock market goes down and risk assets go down more. At some point, it's going to trade more gold and long bonds. And the way I see it this year, it's just up the most. It's up about the same volatility weighting it is versus the NASDAQ and S&P 500. Everything's up. What's so great about that? So here's my point is if you had um, held onto the NASDAQ and you're up 46% or, the, or so this year and had the volatility weighted amounts in S in versus the Bitcoin, it's up about the same. Exactly. Good. Yeah, good points. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive view of all markets, Mike. I appreciate your time. Where can we learn more from you and uh, follow your work? I'm on LinkedIn, Mike McGlone Bloomberg, um, and at Twitter, Mike McGlone, um, at Mike McGlone 11. Okay, we'll put those links in the, down, in the description down below. Appreciate your time, Mike. Thank you for being here. Thank you, David. Talk to you next time. Yeah, I'll see you next time, Mike, for sure. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, follow Mike in the description down below, and subscribe. Mm -hmm.